28 years since I've been preaching. So, and I'm still 25 for the second time. And uh, if you want to, go ahead and turn in your Bible. We'll get there uh, eventually. Do you have, uh, good. Uh, are the notes plugged into? Okay. And uh, you can turn to Ephesians 5. Um, one question, probably, I've seen more than anywhere else, everywhere I've traveled in the world, every church I go to, when you get people coming to a prayer line, you have constantly people coming for one question more than any other question, it, more than healing, uh, more than deliverance. The one thing I see permeating the body of Christ is people praying to understand what is the will of God for my life. I remember one church, real large church, first time I preached at it, had a Bible school for several years, quite a few people had graduated through the Bible school, and when I was praying over people, one after another, and we're not talking about just people going to church, Bible school students saying, I want to know what the will of God is. And in fact, there was a recent church poll where they, uh, they asked uh, Christians, uh, what's the number one question, if you could just ask Jesus one question, what would it be? And the number one question was, what's the will of God for my life? And so, although this is a very important question, most people don't know how to answer it. They don't know. They go through life. And uh, I'm teaching at a Bible school in Texas City, and counts constantly have conversations where people are, um, we had a teacher that said this, they're, they're, they're stabbing in the dark. You know, when, when you're in school, they ask a question, you raise your hand, and you just make up an answer. You don't know it. And we used to have a teacher make fun of it when people were guessing wildly, hoping they get it right. And that's how most believers walk through their Christian life. They're just hoping they'll find out what the will of God is. And today, we're going to begin to dig deep and uh, find out, first of all, what it is and how, to find, or, and how to walk in it. In Ephesians 5, verse 15 through 17, it says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And so Paul tells us as a church, it's, it's preeminent that we understand what's God's will for our life. Yet, I find out, and I preached in Baptist churches as well as, as Spirit-filled churches, the Spirit-filled churches struggle more with the will of God than even the Baptist church. And we're saying, we got the Holy Ghost, we speak in tongues, we got the gifts. Yet, more Spirit-filled Christians struggle to figure out what the will of God is. And it's not just Christians in church, even missionaries. When my kids were growing up, we went through a series of famous missionaries. Now, you would think a missionary knows the will of God in their life. Yet most people that go to another country, there's more politicking and infighting than there is doing the will of God. And the reason is, it's on the inside. People are trying to figure out what does God want them to do. And when they don't know what it is, they frustrate themselves and the people around them. And Ephesians 5.17, it says, understand what the will of the Lord is in, in, in the NIV. Romans 12.2 tells us that we can prove what the will of God is. In Hebrews 10.36, it says, you need to persevere. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. One of my favorite verses in 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we have whatever we ask. We know that we have the request which we've asked from him. So if we know what the will of God is and we pray the will of God, we always get answers. And so it's important that, number one, we figure out what the will of God is and we pray the will of God. If we do that, we get answers every time. That's the reason in Luke chapter 11, the disciples uh, spoke to Jesus and they said, we want to pray like you pray. Why? Because when Jesus prayed, he got answers. Remember when he came to the tomb at Lazarus? And I, I love the conversation Jesus has out loud. He's talking to God the Father, but he's talking out loud so everyone can hear it. And this is what he says when he, he tells him to roll away the stone. And he says, Father, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, what he says is, Father, you've already heard me, but I'm saying this for everyone else that they can believe. In other words, Jesus had already prayed for Lazarus' resurrection before he got to the tent. But he's talking out loud so everyone can hear. We've already had this conversation. We spoke. And he says, then he said, Lazarus, come forth. 
And the whole purpose, in fact, if you read ahead in the story, Jesus purposely doesn't go until after he dies. Why? Because he knew at the end it was for a witness for the power in Jesus' name and who he was. It was a demonstration that he was a Messiah. And so it's important that we understand the will of God. The problem is, is, as I said, most people don't know. And so we have all these winds of doctrine. You know, one of them is it just must be the will of God. This is a fatalistic approach where people, bad things happen, and, well, it just must have been the will of God. I heard a preacher share this one time, and it's, it's almost humorous to the extent he said, you know, Aunt Sue was a lady that, that made blankets for the orphans and, and sewed her life, taught in Sunday school, and, and one day the train came off the tracks, ran right through her home, right over her rock and chair, killed her instantly. It must have been the will of God. But, but that's how some people think. And, and even in the insurance, if you read insurance policies, you know, if a tornado hits your house, they call it an act of God. The hurricane blowing everyone's house, it was an act of God. And so... Even though we laugh about it, the church is that way many times. Bad things happen, people quit church and blame God. And, and the reason is they don't understand what the will of the Lord is. And so we're going to dig in and figure out what is the will of God. Now, there's myths and truths about the will of God. The first myth we want to bust over is the will of God's not a feeling. That, that's the, the problem with feelings is feelings change. How many people love your wife, your husband? Okay. How many people, there, there are some times you were thinking about killing them. Come on. <laughs> some of you say, I ain't raising my hand. I didn't say you did it. I said you thought about it. <laughs> How many people ever disagreed with the person you love? Well, it's, it's the same. We got to understand feelings change. The problem with feelings is this is an emotional approach. And emotions change. Uh, if you live long enough, you have good times and you have. You have high times and you have low times. You have times where you're getting victory and you have times where victory is out of your reach. And so if you live by feelings, you're going to be moved by every circumstance that comes your way. And so the first thing is God's will is not a feeling. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is the most deceitful thing there is, and it is desperately wicked. The problem with our heart is our feelings change. And I want to give you a great misconception about feelings. And I heard this all my life growing up. You know, if you want to be in the will of God, follow peace. Just follow peace. The problem is peace is not always where the will of God is. And I'll, I'll prove it to you. There's a thing called false peace. You ever been in, uh, around someone that is veered away from the will of God and they, I've got peace in my heart. I'll give a, a modern day example. How many of you have ever heard of Amy Grant? She's a great gospel singer in the 80s. Uh, she had marriage problems. She'd been through tons of counseling, as she said. And the uh, pastor of her church was trying to uh, renew their marriage commitment. Well, the problem is, all of a sudden one day she divorces her husband, marries Vince Gill, her next door neighbor. And this is what she said. I've been through tons of counseling, and everyone's told me to stick it out, but I have peace in my heart. It's not from God. And, and what happens is she overrode what's in her heart. And so we don't just follow peace. And I heard that all my life, but the problem is, Jeremiah says the heart is deceitfully wicked. And our heart will, will tell us things are okay. And, and the, the other flip of feelings is, is a lot of times people just do what they want to do and tag Jesus to it. Well, the Lord told me to do this. No, he didn't tell you to do it. I mean, you see all kinds of nonsense. I remember, this is, uh, Gary Wood shared this story, but it's, it's almost comical, the things that people do. Uh, he came in to uh, speak at this church, and whenever the worship was going on, there was a woman that acted like an ambulance. She'd start running around the church going, woo! Woo! And, 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 you know, the pastor had sat down and talked to her. Oh, the Lord told me to do that. Well, Gary Wood's ministering there, and she's doing her siren anointing, and he looked at that and knew that was nothing but flesh. And he stepped in front of her, and he hit her right in the forehead, knocked her down on her back. He said, that's not a Lord. Sit down and be quiet. <laughs> Everybody got shocked. And afterwards, he ministered to her and, and, and talked to her one-on-one. -on -one. But the problem was, she goes, oh, the Lord told me. No, no, the Lord didn't tell you to do that because it's distracting. The Bible says God's not a God of disorder. 
And so it set her free, but the truth of the matter when he sat down one-on-one with her was it was really that she was insecure about who she was, and she just wanted attention. And a lot of times, we as believers can do things just for attention, even as preachers. Yeah. Amen or oh me? Yeah. We can hang around a little bit longer so people will talk to us and tell how good we preach. Pastor James and I talked about this before. Dave Roberson said the funniest thing, and I remember years ago, and I thought, wow, that's me. You know, uh, afterwards, you, you go and you kind of linger a little bit longer in the bathroom. Why? Oh, that's good preaching, preacher. <laughs> so, why? Because it's awkward in the restroom. Someone will say something to you. And you hang out a little bit longer in the lobby, you know, just so you, you can feel good about yourself. And the problem is being in the will of God has nothing to do with your feelings. Sometimes being in the will of God can be the most uh, uncomfortable. That, that's the greatest uncomfortable thing. Why? Because faith is uncomfortable. Faith is getting out there and saying, God, if you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. You know, every time you lay hands on the sick, that's uncomfortable. Why? They don't get healed. You're out on a limb. But that's not your job, it's God's. Every time you witness, that's uncomfortable. Why? They might not like what you got to say. They might like one year I went to Mardi Gras, one guy looked at me and said, you say one more word and I'm going to punch you in the face. So I witnessed to his girlfriend right next to him. And we were actually so crowded he couldn't punch me anyway. But, but I remember I looked at him and I said, you're never going to forget my face. Why? Because I remember when I was on that side of the fence and everyone that ever witnessed to me made me uncomfortable. And I couldn't forget what they said. And... Uh, I, I just throw out a thought. I'll bring this up later, too. Um, I challenge everyone to go to Mardi Gras. I, it'll be the greatest thing you, you could ever do. It, let's say you say, I, I, well, I don't like to speak. Just pray. You know, I used to go with Pastor James, uh, soul winning, and I, I was real uncomfortable, real introverted. He'd say, just stand over there and pray in tongues. That's what I would do. I'd pray in tongues. He'd preach. And pretty soon I was interrupting him, and I was sharing. And, and the thing is, is I began to get out of my shell, but the first thing I used to do is just give out tracts. The first time I took my wife out, so when she goes, I don't want to talk. You don't have to talk. Just pray. Hand out tracts. First time I took Abigail to Mardi Gras, she was two years old. And I had her because no one will turn a baby down. She's handing out tracts. <laughs> There'd be mean guys that didn't want to take it from me. They'd take it from the baby. But the heart is most deceitful and desperately wicked. And so feelings change. We're not moved by feelings. It's, it's not if we have goosebumps. Uh, it's not if, if we cry. That's why, you know, when you come in prayer line, it has nothing to do with whether you felt anything or not. Thank God when you do feel it, but it has nothing to do with feelings. I always say this, if you need a feeling, I'll step on your toe and put a piece of ice down your back. There you got it. You got feelings. You got goosebumps. And uh, secondly, we, in, in, as far as feelings go, we can't be led by prophecy. Uh, here's the problem. Uh, prophecy, although it's a gift of the Holy Spirit, it flows through a person. You understand that? It's filtered. It's filtered. It, and, uh, if you ever flow in the Holy Ghost, some of it is filtering through you and your observations and your experiences. And so if, if you're led by someone else prophesying over you, it'll mislead you sometimes. Got a real good personal friend of my wife's. Uh, her best friend, this lady, flowed in the prophetic, but it became her crutch in her spiritual walk. When she needed a word from God, she'd go to her friend. When she needed a word from God, she'd go to her friend. Then her friend died. Now, all of a sudden, she's got a problem. Why? Because she can't get a word from God anymore. And, and secondly, that person might miss it. I remember the, one of the very first times someone prophesied over me. My very first prophecy, I'm out in Galveston on the seawall passing out tracks, and a friend of mine, I mean, this lady gave him a word, and it was right on. It was things we've been talking about privately and praying over each other, and it was right on. And she looks at me and grabs my hand. She goes, the Lord says you're going to be a martyr. And I remember driving home, I'm thinking, that got me mad. He gets a good word, I, I'm going to die. <laughs> I thought, man, I've just started living for you, God. And I remember when I got home, I was just praying, and, and I said, God, I refuse. I, I, I want to live for you. I just started serving. I, that didn't make sense to me. And the Lord said, that wasn't me. That was just them. <laughs> I never forgot it. You want a scripture for that? In Jeremiah, I think it's 31, it said there are prophets that spoke out of their own spirit. Not even the devil, just out of their own spirit. She just looked at me and just made something up. And so it's important that we're not moved by feelings or prophecies through someone else. And uh, Thirdly, and far as feelings go, sometimes there's a process to getting to the will of God. In Acts uh, 16, verses 6 through 10, 
Speaking of Paul, we, can we agree Paul knew the will of God? He could hear the voice of God? Yet here it says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. In other words, Paul's going a direction and he feels he's going the wrong way. And then that night, he doesn't know what he's going to do. After that, they came to Mysia, and they tried to go to Bithynia. But the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul that night. A man in Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're talking about finding the will of God. And it's not about feelings, and sometimes it's a process. Here's Paul trying to find out where God wants him to go, and, and I want to uh, give an illustration. It's like moving a wheelbarrow. You just got to get it moving. You know, a lot of people are, if Paul would have been sitting in Jerusalem praying and waiting for the will of God, he'd have died in Jerusalem, never preaching the gospel. He just got moving. And it's kind of like, uh, how many people ever played the game hot cold? Remember that where you blindfold somebody and you put an object and as they start getting closer, getting hotter, as they move, you're getting colder and, and you keep moving. Sometimes that's what it is in our own life. If we just get moving, we'll find the right place. You know, the problem is most people are afraid, what if I do the wrong thing? You know, what, what, what if I miss it? It's kind of like driving. How many people ever drove off the road, hit the curb? It doesn't stop you from getting back in the car. In fact, Jonathan and I had this conversation coming over here. You know what the most dangerous thing Americans do? Most dangerous thing. You know, we're afraid of sharks, getting, afraid of getting in a plane. We're afraid. Getting in your car is the most dangerous thing you can ever do in your life. Did you know that? More people die in a car than anything else, yet we get in a car every single day. Uh, you know, when I start my van, I don't worry about getting in my van. And I don't say it to put any fear over you. I pray, you know, over our cars all the time. Every time I get a believer in my office, that angels camp round about them. Why? Because if I am pursuing the will of God, God's going to take care of me. I remember one time when we were pastoring, uh, uh, at the end of the service, the drummer and our praise and worship team wanted to pray over my wife and I. So they gathered around the praying in tongues, lay hands, and they just prayed for the protection of God as we were driving. And he kept saying it over and over. Now, I didn't feel anything in my spirit, but he did. I didn't think anything of it. The following day, we're driving down 288, and as we're going down the freeway, I see the, the big lawnmowers with three uh, brush hogs with three blades, and they're going over the overpass cleaning it. And as I'm approaching the overpass, the brush hog comes over the top and spins over off the bottom, and he throws that uh, blade. It comes off of the mower, and it's flying straight towards the uh, passenger window on the front of my Dodge Caravan right by my wife's head. I don't even have time to pray. I don't even, I don't even have time to say Jesus. I just remember flinching, and the, uh, the blade bounced off of all the windows all the way down the side of my van, didn't crack any of the glass, which is physically impossible. And it was moving so fast, and it moved across the window so fast, it melted lines in the window. And I remember the next Sunday having everyone go out and look at the van, and talking about God's protection. So when we're in the will of God, we don't have to worry about anything. It's not feelings. We just continue to move to do what God wants us to do. The second thing is, the will of God's not a formula. It's not mechanical. It's not step one, step two. And uh, the problem is, as preachers, we like five steps, or seven steps, or ten steps, because it sounds real good, and it's methodical in thinking, but that's not how God operates. In fact, I remember one year at uh, a camp meeting, this one guy got up and he was talking about the will of God. You know, uh, preachers get up and they sell their CDs. And he gets up and he goes, 101 steps to doing the will of God. And it was like a big briefcase of CDs. And I remember, I just thought that was funny to me. I mean, I, I couldn't remember 101 steps. I don't know about you, but I couldn't. <laughs> and uh, it's not methodical and it's not a mechanical approach. The problem with God's will being a formula, first of all, there's contradictions. Got every preacher with their five steps, three steps, ten steps, 101 steps. The second problem with a, a mechanical approach or a formula is perfection is required. And a lot of people believe that's the way it is with God. And, and I'll give you a great example. Everyone in this room's fought before. The devil wants you to believe it's, it's just this perfect step-by-step, step, and if you missed it, and the devil will tell you something. 
What if you'd served God when you were six years old? What if you'd served God since you were 12? Every one of you can remember the first time Jesus spoke. I, I remember I was eight years old. Started having dreams of preaching the gospel one day. I didn't obey Jesus until I was 23. And then I said, what if you'd obeyed till eight years old? The past is the past. And the problem is, is, is if you realize this, if you started serving God the very first moment God started reaching out to you, you'd be exactly where you're at this morning doing what you're doing. Maybe a little less baggage, but you'd be where you're at right now. And when you understand that, it'll set you free. A little less baggage, but you'd be right where you're at this morning. So it's not perfection. And read in the Bible about people that God used. None of these guys were perfect. None of these ladies, in fact, most often when God would approach someone, Gideon, Moses, Deborah the prophetess, every one of them would start off going, not me, God. <laughs> I, I'm not good enough. I can't speak. I'm fearful. I'm not the right one. I'm, I don't have the right pedigree. I'm not in the right family. I don't have the goods. I mean, they weren't perfect people, and, and none of them really had great self-confidence. But God said, look, you just do what I tell you to do, and I'm going to see you through the end of it. And every one of them started moving towards the will of God. They weren't perfect. David, great example. God's not looking for perfect people nor perfect actions, just obedience. And uh, the third problem with the formula is if, if it's a formula and you've got to be perfect, there are no second chances. Thank God, God is a God of second chance. I want to give you what I believe is the biblical approach to getting in the will of God. If you're not in the will of God, the first thing you've got to do is repent. Tell God you're sorry. That's the first step. And once you repent, you're in the will of God. Isn't that easy? Not 101 steps, not three steps, not seven steps. Just repent and then be receptive because God's going to begin to lead you. Now, a great example of this, and I've read this once and never forgot. Imagine if being in the will of God was perfection. You had to do everything exactly the way God wanted you to do it. Okay, if that's true, let's say I married Kim and, and, and I missed it. God, what, God's perfect wasn't uh, Kim. That means that Kim didn't marry someone that was perfect, which means that guy didn't marry someone that's perfect, and the wife he married is not perfect, and, and so on and so on. So everybody's married to the wrong person, Right? I mean, you can carry that all the way to the end. The problem is that's not the way God operates. God starts right where you're at. Uh, remember in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul's talking to the church where some people were coming out of the uh, world and into the church, and he was talking about, okay, you're a believer, your spouse is an unbeliever. He said, don't leave that person. You don't know. You might be their salvation, their way into the kingdom of God. In uh, Matthew 1 Verses 2 through 6, I won't read it, but read of all the imperfect people God used to get in the will of God. And if you read it, it's a genealogy of Jesus. There's people like Rahab, the prostitute. There's, uh, uh, there's actually one girl, I think her name is Tamar. She dressed up as a prostitute and, and uh, had a child from her father-in-law. Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, he's a half-breed. We have Ruth, who was a Gentile. Jacob, who was a con man. We see over and over people that have no right to be in the genealogy of Jesus, yet God chose them in spite of who they were. Now, the third thing is, is God's will is a friendship. Makes it real easy. It's a friendship. You look at people that, that obeyed God, and God will call them his friend. He will communicate to them. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, it says, God is the one who invited you into this wonderful friendship with his son even Christ our Lord. And so there's three things about a friendship. It's not rules, it's a relationship. You notice uh, when, when you fall in love, you don't lay out rules for each other. You just it, It's a part of growing. It's not rules, but a relationship. And it's not a life map, it's a lifestyle. And it's not an agenda, it's an attitude. In a relationship, there's ebb and flow. In fact, part of relationship is, uh, I'll give you the Greek, Greek word, but in uh, Ephesians, it talks about submission. Uh, most men got that down. You've got to submit to your husband. But the verse before it says, says submit to one another. That, ver that word literally means adaption. I mean, the longer you're with someone, the more you're like them. And I can't think of any better illustration in relationship and adapting. When we get around God... We become more like him. And I remember this commercial where 
this guy's sitting with this wife, and you got the figure skating, and, and he's crying, you know, he's watching them figure skate, and he's with his wife, and the cell phone rings, so he grabs the phone, he runs over to the corner, and on the other side, all his friends are watching the basketball game, and they just won at the last second, they're like, did you see the basketball game? Uh, are you watching the basketball game? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. What are you doing? I'm watching the basketball game. <laughs> Yet here he is really enjoying being with his wife watching figure skating. And I dare say every one of us men have watched things we'd never watched before because our wife wanted to watch it and vice versa. And so it's, it's adaption. And so the key is always adapting. Uh, Roman number two, attitudes that blot God's will for your life. The first attitude that can stop or hinder the will of God for our life is being fatalistic about the will of God. We talked about that a little earlier. Whatever will be, will be. It must have been the will of God. And the problem is it's unfair to blame all the bad on God. I mean, the Bible does tell us that we have an enemy, the devil, that who uh, goes about like a roaring lion seeking those who he may devour. And most of the time, especially... In the church, I'm not talking about the lost, I'm talking about the church. Believers blame God when bad things happen. Why did this happen? And I think part of it is our mindset because, how do you say it? But because of the, where we've grown up and what we live under, uh, we, we have a free society. We have rights. I mean, we even make up things that are not right as rights. I mean, a while back there would have been, you have a right to a cell phone. No, you don't have a right to a cell phone. <laughs> It's just crazy the things that we do, and it permeates into the body of Christ where we think everything's all right, but the kingdom of God is a kingdom, and, and it hurts us a lot. I work with a lot of nationalities where we're at. We have a little bit of everything. Last night, I had a, a couple of guys from Iran, and we got to talking, and we were, were laughing about how different it is that they grew up in Iran, came over here, and how uh, here, um, as Americans... We want to assert what we want, and if things aren't right, we just want to make it right. And, and growing up in a country where you have dictators, it's totally opposite. You just roll with the punches. In fact, you'll find people in other countries tend to, to, to go through crisis and come out stronger, whereas many Americans don't. I, I heard this years ago, and I never forgot it. It was a whole sermon, but it was about learning how to take a punch. You know, one of the things the Bible says is Christianity is like a boxing match. And uh, you can be a big punching guy, but if you can't take a punch, you're not going to stay in the ring. How many people remember, who was it, Hollifield? And uh, who, was, who was the guy that bit the guy's ear? What was his name? No, it wasn't. I can't even remember the boxer, but, but he knocked people out in one, two, three rounds. Tyson. That's right, Tyson. And he finally got a boxer that could stay in the ring with him and took him out. Everybody said, no one can beat him, no one can beat him. And he got someone that could take a punch. And he beat him. And it's the same as believers. As Christians in America, a lot of times when bad things happen, what do we normally do? We start looking and going, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe I'm not in the will of God. Maybe, maybe you're in a battle. It has nothing to do with, I mean, when you're, when you're pursuing the will of God, sometimes there's setbacks. How many people read Daniel when he was praying for 21 days and didn't get an answer? Then an angel finally comes. Well, it's the same. If we're going to look at the circumstances around us and determine that determines if we're in the will of God, then, then guess what? The devil's going to send a circumstance, make you give up. So it's, it's not a formula. We're not trying to get in perfect. It's a relationship, and we can't be fatalistic about it. We can't say whatever will be will be. We can't blame God, and we also have to realize that it, it, it's, it's affected by us. Decisions we make, determine if we're the will of God. We're not a puppet. God's not just moving everything. In Luke eleven two, one one of the things Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, he says that we ought to pray, Father, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. In other words, we have a part to play in this. It's not God just doing whatever he wants to do. It's, it's humans yielding to God. That's why the Bible says God's more interested in obedience than he is in sacrifice because he can do far more with obedience than he can with the sacrifice in John 7 17 it says if anyone chooses to do God's will if anyone chooses to do God's will 
he will find out whether my teaching comes from God. And so being in God's will involves decisions. It's not God doing whatever he wants to do. He's not just moving our life through the step. Uh, in fact, there's a whole doctrine of this called predestination, that everything we do is predestined. And the problem with that is the Bible is very clear. We have a choice. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you before the foundation of the world. In other words, God knew we were going to get born again, and he called us out, but we still have to choose. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a sinner's prayer. Just whoever gets saved, gets saved. In fact, 200 years ago, that's what the church believed. There was no missionary effort, no evangelism. People just thought, well, if they're going to be a Christian, God's going to make them. And the problem with believing that God has every step uh, laid out in our life, whatever decisions we make or not, we start getting a little ridiculous on it. It's like the guy that believed in predestination. He's going down the stairway, and he falls and rolls and hits his head on every step. When he gets to the bottom, he looks and goes, God, I'm glad that's over with. (laughs) Why? Because he thought it was predestined. Well, that's not how God works. It's not fatalistic. We, dis- we make decisions every day that get us in the, in the will of God or out. Th- think about this. How many people can look back 10 years ago and remember one decision you'd like to change? Huh. There's a lot of them I'd like to change. Yeah. Well, why? Because it has a part to play. God doesn't make us do anything. He just wants us to yield. He leads us. So it involves my decisions. Secondly, the second obstacle is being fearful about God's will. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and to give you a hope and a future. So one of the things a lot of people uh, struggle with is they're afraid to do God's will because they're afraid what God might make them do. Uh, There's a preacher by the name of Frederick Price, and and it's, it's a neat example of how fear can keep people out of the will of God. His whole teenage years, into his 20s, he, he ran from the will of God. God called him to preach as a young man, and, and it was in a sermon where a missionary was sharing. And there was one story the missionary shared that the devil used to keep Frederick Price fearful of the will of God. And in this story, the, the missionary was just sharing a story where he ate a caterpillar. It, it was one of the jungle things that they would eat, and, and he ate a caterpillar. And from then on, as a little boy, the, the devil would tell him, you obey God, you're going to go to the jungles and you're going to eat caterpillars. <laughs> and this, this guy grew up in Los Angeles in a big city. He, he was fearful from ever leaving the big city, living in the jungle, eating caterpillars. And, and one day he finally gave up, went to an altar call, and he just cried out, God, I'll even go to the jungle. I'll even eat caterpillars. And he said it was so clear, God said, I don't want you going to the jungle. You'll make a fool of yourself. And I don't want you eating caterpillars. You're going to start a church right here in Anaheim, California, right outside of Los Angeles. Why? He was fearful of the will of God. And it locked him for decades from stepping into the will of God. Why? He was afraid. Nothing wrong with being fearful if you'll just let God change that fear into faith. Remember Moses? God, I can't get in front of Pharaoh. He won't listen. The Jews won't listen to me. And God gave him the words to speak, and he went ahead and stepped ahead of that. And so it's important that we, we're not fearful about the will of God. Another problem with being fearful is a lot of times, and I've had this thought before, sometimes we're afraid God will make us do things we don't want to do. And, and I want you to understand something that, uh, that it's easy to say but hard to understand. God knows you better than you know you. And the Bible says he knows your inward parts, your inner thoughts. He knows your dreams and ambitions more than you know them. A lot of things you want to do is because... You, you've been influenced by the world around you. There's things that, that are inside of you that's desires you don't even know about because you hadn't got exposed to it yet. You get around the will of God and, and doing what God wants you to do, God will wake up desires you didn't know were there. And uh, the third thing is being frustrated about the will of God. In Romans 8, 28, it says, We know that in all things God works for the good for those who love Him, and have been called according to his purpose. The New Living Bible says God causes everything to work together for good. Now, the reason people get frustrated, and, and we said, uh, I mentioned this earlier, is because circumstances can be frustrating sometimes. If, you, if a circumstance will stop you from pursuing the will of God, you're going to have circumstances. You know, you'll, you'll have your boss yell at you. You'll have all kinds of things happen. Why? To get you off course. This morning I got up early and, and I got to thinking we've got two new bosses at work and they're both 
uh, extreme leaders. I don't know the way to put it. They're hard to work for. And so in, in the last few months, I've just been adapting to work under the new regime. And this morning I got up, and both of them, are, they're lost as a billy goat. I mean, they die, they go straight to hell. I, and I know because I've had conversations with them. And the Lord woke me up, and he said, you know, last three or four months you've adapted, but you hadn't influenced. And I thought, yeah. I mean, we've had conversations, but, but I hadn't really been pursuing why they're my boss. Anyone ever pray for a boss to leave? <laughs> I've prayed it more than once. And every time the Lord said, I've sent them there for a reason. I didn't send them there for you to pray to get rid of them. I sent them there for you to change them. And this morning I got up and I started praying for the first time that both of these guys get born again. And one of them believes every religion. The other one, I don't even know what he believes. And so I thought, okay, God, it's not impossible. And so I started praying. But the problem is, is if we get frustrated... What happens is we start praying against the will of God sometimes. We're asking God to change things to make everything comfortable. And it, it, we'll, we'll find out real quick, God doesn't want you comfortable. He wants you in faith. Uh, then it's not my story, but it's my brother's. I remember when he first felt called to preach, he was calling, you know, God, I want you to send me somewhere to preach the gospel. And, and most people, that's the first thing, inclinations on the inside, is I want to leave where I'm at, go somewhere and preach. And I want to tell you something, if you can't be influential where you're at, God will never send you somewhere else, Amen. ever. Why? You, you, you read, everyone that's ever been successful in missions was influential everywhere they went. And many of them never got to the place they wanted to go. Just wherever God ended up putting them, that's where they were influential. And so my brother prayed this prayer, God, I just want to go and preach the gospel. And, and so he gets this new job, and he's got an atheist, he's got a Muslim, He's got a Jehovah Witness. He's got a Mormon. He, I mean, he's got every hodgepodge. And, and he prayed this, if I get a job, God, I want to work with Christians. I, I prayed that before. Just want to work with Christians. Why? Because it's comfortable. And everybody was a heathen. And I remember my brother sharing this story. He said, he said Lord, would you get all these heathens? I want some Christians here. He said, Holy Ghost said, make them Christians. <laughs> and so... He just made a decision to influence those around him. And the first opportunity he had, you know, these are all lost guys. And uh, uh, it was my brother's birthday, so a bunch of guys got together, hired a stripper to show up at work to strip in front of my brother. Well, my brother's working. It's in a uh, manufacturing place. And when, he, uh, when this girl comes in half-dressed, he ran in the bathroom and locked himself in. Now, at this point, he, he didn't know there was anyone that there was a Christian. No one's acting like a Christian. And that lady's laughing. Everyone's laughing outside the door. They're playing music. And all of a sudden, he hears this lady that was a secretary. And he hears this lady slap that girl and started telling her, you get out of here <laughs> right now. And this girl started in Jesus' name in this girl. And the girl ran out in her high heels. My brother could hear it. And so he came out and he goes, I didn't know you were a Christian. And all of a sudden, this lady started getting loud with the Christianity. Why? Because Bob started doing it. And that wasn't the last opportunity. Then another time, it was they made awnings, aluminum awnings. He was running the material through that chopped the aluminum, and he took off a half an inch of his middle finger. Took it right off. And he said his first thing, most guys, you cut your finger off, you're going to be cussing. Why? Because you squeeze something, what's inside comes out. And so my brother grabbed his finger and started going, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. They're like, what? And he held his finger up. One guy fainted. <laughs> I cut my finger off. And so they rushed him to the hospital, and uh, he got to the doctor. The doctor looked at it, and my brother said, In the name of Jesus, my finger's going to grow back. The doctor went, <laughs> Doesn't work that way, unless you're a lizard. <laughs> and so... Two weeks later, when they took the bandage off, it had grown back. And it was so miraculous, when the doctor looked at his hand, he took the bandage off, he goes, show me the other hand. He thought my brother switched bandages on him. And he showed him both of them, and the doctor's reading his chart. My brother said, you ever seen a miracle before? And the doctor got real uncomfortable and left the room. Of course, when he got back to work, he showed his finger to everybody at work. And, you know, pretty soon, everybody was asking him to pray for them. But the thing is, is being in the will of God, we can't get frustrated 
when we're uncomfortable. As I said this earlier, be walking in faith is uncomfortable. Why? Because you have, you have to get to the place. Real faith walk is when you're at the end of your ability and you need God's ability. I mean, I never would have thought I would work in car sales, and I got out there and got out the end of my rope and said, God, if you don't show up, I can't sell anything. And so we can't be frustrated. And one of the keys to not get frustrated about the will of God is realize the will of God is a long-term process. It's a marathon. You remember Paul says in Hebrews 2, we're running in a race? It's a marathon. It's a long-distance run. And the key isn't how you start, it's how you finish. Has anyone ever run long distance? Uh, you know, when you run long distance, people that have never run long distance, you can spot them real quick. They start out real fast. And, and, and you watch, in fact, the guys that are good, they'll get behind them and let them cut the wind in front of them, just run right behind them. And pretty soon when they get to that last lap, the guys that are good runners, they take off. And it's the same as a believer. It's a long-term goal. Setbacks, things like that, they don't bother us. In fact, in Paul's day when they talked about the marathon, it wasn't a pretty round track. It was actually, the, the, the marathon is actually a 26-mile trek, and they would retrace the, uh, the, the ba- there was a uh, famous runner, he was a messenger, and he ran from the battlefield to tell what had happened. He, he ran 26 miles straight, and then he collapsed and died. And they would retrace through the mountains that race. And so sometimes it wasn't smooth. Sometimes you could twist your ankle. You kept running. And it was the same as a believer. We can't get frustrated with the things that come across us. It's a long-term process. And in a long-term process, it's going to include both pleasures and setbacks. It's just part of the process. And the right attitude is faith, Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In fact, one of the most co- quoted scriptures by Paul out of the Old Testament, in the New Testament, is the just shall live by faith. And faith is that place of uncomfortableness where we just trust God. We get out there and say, God, if you don't show up, nothing's going to happen. And getting in the will of God requires faith. It requires sometimes being uncomfortable. And, and it doesn't mean that he's going to spell out the will for you. And, and I think this is probably the biggest mistake most people make. There's a whole course if you like to do studies at home. Uh, Blackaby has a study, uh, Knowing and Doing the Will of God. And he makes a profound statement that, that really uh, was a paradigm shift for me as a spirit-filled believer. And, and this is what he said. The, the will of God is not something specific. You know, when, when I was praying about marrying the right woman, I didn't turn to the Bible and find Kirby 1-6 and go, Mary Kim. <laughs> There's not a scripture like that. What I did is I got involved in what God was doing. Now, let's go back to the beginning. In, in the beginning, you've got Adam. There's no Eve. And God looks at Adam and says, it's not good for man to be alone. So does God make Eve for Adam? No, he doesn't. The very first thing he does is he put Adam to work. Name the stars. Name the animals. Tend to the garden. And in the midst of Adam finding out what God's doing and getting involved in it, then God brings Eve to Adam. Great principle. Greatest way to find the right person is not on the internet, (laughs) not at a single place at a church. It's just doing what God wants you to do. Here's here's the key. When, When you're doing what God wants you to do, you'll find the right person. And How do you find out what the will of God is? The will of God is not some specific step-by-step plan where God says step into this lockstep and now you're in the will of God. What the will of God is, is stop and look around you. Look look what God's doing. And if you'll jump in and get involved with what God's doing, you'll be in the will of God. In fact, the better word for that, if you look up the word will, it's also plan. It's interchangeable. The plan of God. And God's plan, God's blueprint... Is, is simple. Jesus stated it out. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He also said, make disciples. He also said, get filled with the Holy Ghost, that, that you can be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In fact, the will of God is being influential. But, but the key is to stop and see what God wants you to do. Uh, and I've seen this over the years. A lot of times people are like, you know what? 
I feel like God's called me to go to Ireland, to Bolivia, to Mexico, to Nicaragua, to, to Burma. And I found this out. People that have went to another country, I don't care. You can pick just any country. God will speak to you when you get there. You go to Ireland, God will call you to Ireland. You go to Thailand, God will call you to Thailand. You say, why? Because God's doing something there. And if you'll jump in and get involved with what God's doing, God will use you. Now, I had the privilege. I got to go to a lot of different places. And every country I ever went to, God called me there. You say, was God confused? No. God's active in that country. And the moment I got active there, I'd get involved with what God was doing. You know, when I, when I got uh, into car sales, God called me to witness to the people that are there. Some of them backslidden Christians, some of them non-believers. But everywhere I'm at, God's active. And the key is, is getting active in what God's doing. You, you'll find the will of God if you just stop and look. That's why Mardi Gras is a great time to find the will of God. Why? Go in there, just pray. Hand out a track. Talk. You'll, you'll, and, and not everyone you talk to is ready, but you'll find someone that is. You'll find at least one person. I, I, and I'll close with this. I remember when I was running from God. Everywhere I went, there was someone passing out tracks. Everywhere I went. I mean, I'd even hide behind my big guy, buddies. And I didn't want them to see me. And, and there would be guys, I'd go to a rock concert, and I remember this, I never forgot, there's this skinny, scrawny little guy, couldn't have been five foot tall, and he's pushing my friends out of the way and goes, this is for you. <laughs> my friends are laughing at him. I could not take the track. I put it in my pocket, I'm thinking, how did he see me? <laughs> I'm running from God. God, he ain't running from me. <laughs> I like David. You and David ran from God once. You see it in Psalms. He said, God, if I go to the deepest ocean, to the very deepest depths, you're there. If I go to the highest mountains, you're there. To the darkest place, you're there. It didn't matter where David got, God's still there with him. Why? Because uh, the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he also says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so the good news is you're just one step from being in the will of God. Just one step, just opening your eyes and looking around and finding out what is God doing around here? What's he doing in the church? What's he doing in the city? What's he doing in the world? And start getting active in doing it. I mean, you can start right where you're at. In fact, you can affect the world without ever leaving Lamar, Texas. I, I remember, how many people remember the massacre that happened in Rwanda and Burundi? I, my, I didn't, most people never heard of the countries before. One year to the date before that massacre started, we had a big wall map, and I used to pray over Africa, and one day I saw those two countries. I never heard of them before, just almost in the dead center of Africa, and I just started praying and made a, just, just prompted to pray over those countries every day, just praying and praying. I don't think I was the only one doing it, but I was one of them, and I remember when I saw it on the news, I instantly knew why God had me praying over there. And uh, there's a group of boys called the Lost Boys. Anyone ever heard of them? They're actually, their moms and dads, almost all of their parents were murdered, and they fled across a desert, and they walked for like four or five days without food or water. And there were church Christians in America that sponsored, brought them over, had them naturalized, they're citizens. I actually met one of the Christians behind bringing them over. They got them educated. And it was phenomenal. These little boys that were 8, 9, 10 years old, now they're 16 to 18, 19 years old, and they were reuniting them with their family first on uh, digitally. They, they had uh, iPads, and they were talking to their family. Then they were going to fly them, uh, their families over to the United States and help them get in as citizens as well. But I remember hearing all that. I remember thinking, wow, years ago, I'm just praying over a map. No idea why I'm praying over those countries. And God still has his plan in, in spite of what was going on there. You know, if you want to get in the will of God, the first thing is realize it's not about feeding. It's not about frustration. It's not about the circumstances around you. It's just opening your eyes and looking at what is God doing right now and jumping in. And when you get in what God's doing, you're in the will of God. And I'll give you one verse to close, and that's in John 4.35. Jesus told the very same thing to his disciples. I believe they wanted to be in the will of God. They're following Jesus. And he says to them, don't say the harvest is three, four months down the road. He said, open your eyes. Open your eyes. The harvest is already white. It's already white around you. He was speaking about the lost, the lost Jewish people that Messiah is working right in the midst of them and they don't even know who he is. 
And he pointed out it's right now. The season to harvest is right now. And I say it to you too, just open your eyes. There's always the opportunity, every day you have, everywhere you're at, to, to literally influence the people around you and start walking in the will of God. Father, we thank you right now that you said the gospel is simple. Father, even a child or wayfaring man can understand it. And Father, the will of God, it's not complex. Father, it's just opening our eyes and seeing what are you doing? Who are you influencing? Father, where are you wanting us to, to influence people? Father, either to be born again or to grow and mature in Christ. And we just thank you right now that, Father, Celebration House, Father, is a place that's known. Father, that it's known for its personality. Father, of winning souls and discipling those that are saved. Father, not just having big services, not just having entertainment, but, Father, having something that transforms the lives of people and cities, counties, and even nations. And we thank you for the opportunity to jump in in what you're already doing in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. And I said this earlier, you know, there's one step to getting back in the perfect will of God. With every head bowed and eyes closed. You know, maybe this morning you, you feel like you're on the outside looking in, that you're not yet in the will of God. Maybe there's something holding you back, habits, hobbies relationships, whatever it may be, God wants you in his perfect will. And the, the, the one and only step is just repent. Say, God, I'm sorry, and get in the will of God. And I want us to pray this together as a church. Everybody say, Father, Father I, thank you I thank you that you committed everything, you committed everything even, your son, even your only son, to open the will of God, will of God for, my for my life. And I repent, I repent of, every of every thought, every habit, Every hobby that keeps me for pursuing what you're pursuing. And I leave it at your feet. And today, I'm beginning my journey in the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. It's that easy. You know, it's a daily thing. And sometimes we got to make adjustments like I shared earlier where I'm at work, working, and God's saying, you're not influencing enough. And that's really the, at, at the end of the age, when we stand before Jesus, all he really is going to ask is, were we influential? Did we use our talents to influence those around us? So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor James. My pleasure. You know, there's an anointing in this room.